I just wanted to say a, a very good morning to everyone. Thank you so, so much for joining us uh, for today's webinar. Um, this is a partnership webinar between Foregone Solutions and Robustel. Um, a lot of you in here will probably be familiar with Foregone. Uh, most of you should hopefully by now be familiar with Robustel, but if not, we'll do a little bit of introduction so you can get to know both myself and David, uh, and we'll, um, we'll get started now. Okay, so just a brief agenda for today. Um, we're going to do a quick welcome from both myself and from David uh, at Robustel, and then we'll get straight into the content. Uh, we're going to go through various topics relating to 5G, 5G products, bit of myth busting, um, as well as obviously learning a bit more about the new Robustel R5020 5G router, which is a brand new product, product to market, um, and then potentially looking at the future of 5G as well. Uh, we are going to do a Q&A at the end. Um, obviously, there is the chat panel on the right-hand side for you to ask questions. Uh, what we'll probably do is we'll probably breeze through, unless, unless David has any wants to do anything differently, but we'll probably breeze through the presentation, go through, and then we'll take a look at all of the questions at the end, um, and then we'll enable um, Q&A mode at the end so you can ask us uh, ask us some questions and we'll be able to um, to answer those. So a little bit about me, my name's Jamie Lawrence. Uh, as you can probably tell, I have aged quite badly since that photo was taken, um, specifically in the hairline department. I do apologize, it's the best one I had. Um, but I'm the sales manager here at Foregone Solutions. I've been with the business now just over one year. Um, so I manage the sales team. A lot of you will probably have already um, spoken or worked with me in the past or mem members of my team. Um, and obviously, I'm, I'm here to help with any particular sales inquiries. Uh, a bit about Foregone. Uh, we were founded in 2010. And we've been a global distributor of wireless networking equipment in that time. Although, as the name suggests, uh, we started out mainly in the sort of cellular area, hence the 4G at the start of the name the company used to be sort of referred to as 4G on. Uh, I have proposed that maybe for this webinar, we could have changed the company name to 5G on. Uh, apparently, there were some logistical issues with that. So we'll keep, keep going with the current name for the time being. Um, the great thing about Foregone is we are truly a global distributor of, uh, of wireless networking and cellular equipment. We, we offer the latest industry leading products. and what separates us from our competition is that we are truly vendor agnostic, uh, something that a lot of our competitors cannot say they are. The reason we're working with Robusto and promoting Robusto in his webinar today is because we believe that they offer the best solutions in this crowded marketplace. Uh, we offer, again, an industry leading reseller program, which a lot of the people on this webinar will already be familiar with. And uh, again, exclusive deals available for resellers and large scale projects. And now I'd like to introduce uh, my good friend, David Evans. So David, take it, take it away. Thanks a lot, Jamie. Appreciate that. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for um, joining this uh, 5G webinar. Um, I think the, the goal here, actually, just before I do get started, Jamie, have, we got, uh, have I got the controls? I do have the controls. Got everything yeah, we could yeah, need. I think, um, yeah, you've got all the controls. Um, so yeah, I'm the uh, global solution architect at Robustel. Uh, I've been with Robustel for three years now, and in previous roles, um, I've worked on the airtime side of things uh, for an MVNO um, that successfully sold out to Arm, uh, as in the processor company. So that, that was uh, four years, and, and prior to that, a similar kind of thing. So over that time. Um, there's been an opportunity to try and actually piece together that a lot of people sell SIM cards, a lot of people sell routers, but most people don't want either of those things. They want working comms. And um, that is really what we, we, we try and get towards through best technical practices. Um, the company itself is still relatively new. In fact, the reason why I'm involved is I, I met one of the founders in a, in a previous role. So you know, over over eleven years now, I've known um, I've known of the guys, and uh, it was it was three years ago that I was invited to join them, and uh, it was a really really good move. Um, the, the the growth has now become quite exponential. Um, obviously. The, the brand name is not one that, that stands out. We're not quite up with the um, 
the blue chip companies yet. And I'm not sure in this space you ever quite get there. Um, it's not the sexiest of topics, but uh, certainly the the, the growth um, is is very impressive. And and what I really like is the growth certainly in the UK is coming from doing good business. We we help and support and provide advice and and config etc. So that really is. There's a bit of preamble there, but I think the important thing is to say where so much is, you know, is going to an online thing. Um, we're seeing the the rewards of trying to keep it a bit more human um, and have those conversations. That means customers get it right first time. One of the other reasons um, I think Robusta are able to excel is it's actually a very relatively narrow um, product range. So fundamentally it's cellular routers now there's variations on a theme you can call them iot gateways you can call them modems i think if it's got a cellular element or a LoRaWAN element then uh, robust are definitely worth talking to uh conversely if it doesn't then um you know that the, there isn't really anything on offer so it's it's a very clean um almost niche within the gener uh, sort of general electronics world um proposition but really where the value is and the reason why the, the growth is there is, is these days it's entirely a software proposition. We have an operating system, Linux OS on the edge, and we have in Microsoft Azure, we have a cloud platform. And it's what can you actually do to generate value, to save people time, to save cost, and get actually deeper and deeper logistical integration. So our job really is to espouse the value associated with software and if that doesn't exist already then we have 70 software engineers that can write that software and i think we're already engaging with um several foregone customers um to provide that kind of service and that's where the whole business gets much more sticky for everyone um obviously if you sell the same part number uh, as many other people it's it becomes a tough gig if you sell a, a part number with a custom piece of software, well, it's a very different proposition. And uh, that's how we're trying to win together. So that's something, that's uh, a, a slide on the, the cloud platform that uh, I'll come on to at the end. But for now, the um, enough preamble, the main event. In fact, I, I feel like I should do a Steve Jobs here and actually do the unveiling of the... Uh, New Robustel 5G router. Um, not quite the Apple experience, I'm afraid, guys, but uh, I think you get the idea. But certainly, it, we're very proud of it, very excited, and actually quite lucky. There's an element of fate um, in how we come to be quite early to market with a very cost-effective solution. Uh, early to market with a premium price is, is a little bit easier, and hopefully I'll share how that's come about with you uh, going forward. First thing we want to do is to add value for everyone that's that's taken the time to attend and just give you a bit about what you need to know about 5G. Now, um, honestly speaking, I didn't add this slide as a bit of a techie. It come from the marketing department. So we will do that uh, preamble, which, as you know, 2G, 3G, 4G, and now 5G. And if, like uh, many of you, I should imagine there's there's a little bit of a cynic in you that says, well, you know, is some of this just the network operators doing something that, you know, they're doing the what next because they, they need to keep their revenue graphs going up and to the right. And honestly speaking, I do think that is the case. But through listening to the market, to customers, there is a significant commercial opportunity at the right price in the next uh, it, certainly in the next 12 months, uh, and then it, then it grows from there as we move into mainstream 5G. So, honestly speaking, I'm far more animated about the commercial opportunity of 5G as it is now um, than I was some time ago. And that's just what comes from talking to people. And again, hopefully some of that will come through. So, a little bit of the tech that you need to know, not the the geeky stuff that you can't change, but the, to enable you to have a, a base level conversation. So in 5G, there are two distinct 
band. So there's frequency range one and frequency range two. And frequency range one is pretty much everything that we've done already. Range two, I think you might have caught me um, uh, moving into that space of this is the uncharted territory that people are nervous about. Uh, we haven't densely put up radios around people um, at this at this frequency. Um, certainly not. Um, probably not a forum for uh, for the debate on um, on the safety, etc. Um, of five, of millimeter wave frequencies, uh, the, but. I think if you have a read up, you'll see that there has been um, other applications of this RF at that frequency, not at the same scale, but um, the, the the evidence is, uh, the anecdotal evidence so far doesn't seem to be alarming, but um, yes. Anyway, we're gonna go with uh, millimeter wave. The, that's been decided because you can get uh, enormous bandwidths over the air. Um, whether you need them or not um, may be uh, an interesting narrative, but um, yeah, that's that's what it's targeted at: low latency, high frequency, uh, high frequency, hence high throughput. So this is um, it's a bit tricky to see, but this is uh, it, it, probably the best bet is you go onto the. Um, Go into this yourself separately if you're interested in the sort of rate of deployment and the the regional level of deployment and the a, a practical thing for you to know about is the band that is in fact 84 percent of the sort of deployments we get in europe are currently using n78 which is 3.5 gigahertz so you can see at three and a half gig the the, the propagation uh, challenges that poses. I mean, 2.4 gig for Wi-Fi in a house is a challenge. So um, now, obviously, modulation things will be different. But yeah, it's uh, we're moving into interesting territory. How much more power or how much more densification do you need to um, to to make that reach lots of places? I mean, the reality is it's a mix of high and low frequency for coverage um, for coverage purposes, and then higher frequency for bandwidth purposes purposes so i suspect radio planning is getting rather more complicated than it was um back in the good old days of gsm and gprs very brief note on the us just when you think you know we might be harmonizing and standardizing the the guys in the us are very much going straight to millimeter wave for the most part whereas europe is generally all sub six gigahertz um for the most part so it's, it's kind of this is just to be aware that you know already we've got this sort of lack of harmonization diversification of of what standards to adopt and how you're going to apply um the technology that's there for consumers this this is a really um actually for me this was a really powerful slide because i wasn't entirely clear on you know how how things were being uh, laid out um, in in Europe and certainly for for UK and Europe, you have five G radios at the edge with a four G core. So the core hasn't changed, and so if you start adding the ability for every phone to do half a gigabit per second, it would be reasonable to ask if the core is has the throughput to serve all of those users with those sort of. Um, uh, you know that that kind of throughput so yeah there's there's questions still still questions to be asked but there's certainly improved already improvements to to be had there now non standalone is where we are now in the future uh we have standalone so 5g core 5g at the edge and using um uh, the millimeter wave frequencies so yeah, I think NSA is is a route to to fast deployment, and it's a complex. It's actually quite a complex thing under the bonnet of how you have a four G anchor network, a four G anchor, and then uh, you you effectively use carrier aggregation to get uh, additional five G resource. So it's 
It's what's known as ENDC mode, uh, which is dual connectivity. So if you um, if you take one of the, the actual radio modules, something something like that, the radio module inside, when you interrogate it, um, they now have a new state in 5G NSA, which says I'm dual attached, which is the NSA um, kind of way to, uh, to connect to, to 4G as the anchor and 5G when you want bandwidth. And to the best of my understanding, um, I would check on this, but to the best of my understanding, the 5G um, uh, kind of speed boost, it, it, there's an element of on-demand. Uh, there's certainly commentary about you need to be using bandwidth to for the, the resources to be allocated. So I guess the point of that is not to do it in detail, but just to be aware that there is actually quite a, a massive change under the bonnet and a minor change that you need to be aware of in, in how these things are actually performing and behaving. So hopefully with that context, this slide can, can make a bit more, more sense because where we are at the moment is release 15. And that's arguably get something out the door quickly and then you can say you've launched 5G. Um, there's no question you can get better bandwidth, which is a, a value to, to a lot of people. Um, but a lot of the more involved IoT or, or specialist use cases comes in subsequent releases. So release 16, release 17 talks about things like um, URL, LLC, ultra-reliable, low-latency comms for robots in factories. Um, uh, and lots of the big industry guys are, are looking into this sort of thing now. But in the more consumer ISP world, we've actually got a relatively cheap route to quite a lot more bandwidth. So the product itself um, is the R5020. It's got four Ethernet ports. Um, you can see our industrial heritage shining through there. So we've got RS-232, RS-485, digital in, digital out. Um, the ACC marking um, infers that uh, there is an ignition control capability. So if you put it in a vehicle, it doesn't drain the battery. Um, underneath that SIM cover there, there's two SIM cards, so you can fail from one to the other uh, and vice versa. Important note that it is dual SIM but single radio, as most of these entry-level products are. So um, only one SIM can be dialed up at any one time. And then you've got the, the four antennas for the MIMO effect and a couple of Wi-Fi antennas for the uh, 802.11ac, 2.4 gig and 5 gig Wi-Fi, respectively. Um, very important thing to note is that it's got uh, an eMark on the product, and this loosely means it's um, it's fit for purpose for vehicle applications. So you, some people, you know, bus operators or commercial vehicle operators might mandate um, an e-mark and as an aftermarket retrofit there's an argument that it's uh, a, a not a necessity but the way you remove all doubts you say yes we tick that box so that could be powerful and obviously vehicles are one of the most obvious targets for higher bandwidth um, traditionally you know buses and things like that we used bonded routers you know maybe in the early days bonding eight 3g sims together well, if it's just bandwidth you're looking for in a city centre, um, yeah, that, that's all you would need. Just a few other specs worth cherry picking um, from the device. Um, it's got the typical sort of robust cell temperature range, minus 25 to plus 70, 9 to 36 um power so any industrial vehicle um applications running off 12 or 24 volts are covered the if you don't choose the vehicle ignition version you can have the poe version um so you can obviously site this in a convenient location it seems that loft space is something that keeps coming up um people want to run a bit of cat five or cat six up into the loft to get the best possible uh reception 
um, that's what PoE lends itself to. The uh, one of the Ethernet ports can be set as WAN, and the Wi-Fi can be WAN as well. So you can fail between 5G, Wi-Fi, and, and you know, plugging into your existing broadband as your bearers to the internet. So failover applications are um, are valid. And then down in the bottom right, you can see um, if you do want to go into a, a deeper dive into what's going on with the um, the frequencies, you'll see that the the non-standalone and the standalone frequencies. What is important as well is there's a huge amount of 4G coverage there. So that is a global 4G um, list of frequencies. So, uh, you know, marine applications, for example, if you're moving into different continents, uh, where you can get a real patchwork quilt of LTE frequencies, um, it can be a benefit for that as well. So this is this is uh, really sharing some of the history of the product. Excuse me. So I think uh, we've actually been quite lucky. So the original product that you can see there is the R2110 which was commissioned by a very large uh, uh, Asia-Pac network operator. Um, they actually paid for the paid Robustel for the design, a seven-figure fee. Um, and it was higher, uh, it was a higher performing CPU platform than, than Robustel would normally um, provide because um, you know it's a, a higher position and it's higher cost. And much of robust cell stuff, you know, is targeted to be high, um, high volume, low value, low cost. Um, but this platform just happened to have um, a powerful enough CPU and a USB three interface, such that it could be adapted very quickly to um, take the RM five hundred Q five G module from Quetel, which is kind of a mainstay uh, as a brand these days. Quetel is a very very well recognized um, module vendor. You're almost at the point where you, 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 on a price performance ratio, you don't have a huge deal of, uh, of choice because you can get very good product, very good support and uh, very keen prices. So to have a platform that can already integrate that module uh, gives us a fast time to market, very competitive price point, 20,000 of these devices have already gone out in Japan and, and several thousand around the world. Um, the platform was in vehicle ready in the first place, hence the eMark. Uh, it's tried and tested. So, um, you know, hopefully none of us will be uh, guinea pigs with any of this because, uh, well, apart from the RF element, everything else is, has been done before. Um, and one of the other nice things is you can have a 4G and a 5G vary in, in the same enclosure so you can standardize on on one type of product uh, and the customers that want 5g will pay about three times two to three times the price um of the 4g version and then in a way you don't have to have that debate or that fight with a the customer they can choose uh, what they see see fit but with some advice on why future proofing might be not be a bad idea so they're they're the the pros now the cons and we're quite happy to be uh, transparent about these um, because we feel the business case is very strong for 70% of applications. So limited temperature range, minus 25 to plus 70. Um, that, may, that may be a limitation in vehicles in the Middle East. So it, it, it's binary, it is or it isn't. You know, um, if we can't capture some of that market, or if the you know the devices are in air conditioned enclosures within vehicles, then obviously it's a non issue. But so by industrial standards, it's arguably limited. By uh, consumer standards, it's not not at all limited. Um, some of the, the the more enterprise customers find the sort of I O uh, and the screw terminal blocks and things like that a little off putting. Um, it's it's it is commonly observed on but if customers like the price and the performance generally it's a very small number that don't 
that absolutely don't proceed because of that um, because of that appearance. It's not to say it doesn't happen, but um, you know it's something to be something to be mindful of. And because this platform, as I say, was designed a, a couple of years ago, uh, even with the higher end CPU, the the actual compute that is required to run a TCP IP stack and a USB three driver at the sort of bandwidths we're looking at over the air now, as well as running a Linux box, it's, it's getting, you know, quite significant. So the tests so far have topped out about 500 megabits per second, about half a gig of raw throughput uh, on 5G. Now, LAN to WAN throughput is, you know, on a pure wired connection is about a gigabit per second. But we're running all of the other, uh, you know, all of the other, driver related things you're topping out about half a gig now again some people might argue that that's not good enough but here's some here's some information um or evidence that would suggest that you know you can pay twice as much um but based on this audit report um from done in london last year the absolute maximum peak data rate not average or sustained but average uh, absolute peak was 338 megabits per second um so and that was on voda um and you can see the real world performance across the networks on average was way way adrift of that now interestingly um, this doesn't correlate with my findings. So I actually did um, I did a test for this box before Christmas. I got 300 meg down, which fits within those findings, but I got 100 meg up on Vodafone uh, around the Putney area um, where I was at the time. And if you if you just took this graph, it, it's it's mind blowingly asymmetric still, um, and I think if you, my interpretation of this graph, if you look carefully on the 4G EE side, you'll see that the 4G EE upload uh, max was 56.4 and the 5G EE upload was 56.3. So that's, um, that, that's possibly indicating that uh, advanced LTE um, outperformed 5g in these tests but certainly I've, I've i've got 100 meg up which um for me was was quite important because that that upload bandwidth from the edge to the cloud because of the asymmetry of most services um for me anyway forms the biggest bottleneck um ever faster in the download is not necessarily changing changing that much but uh, yeah being able to go 10 times faster in the up direction means that we can move files to the cloud quicker, which for some businesses or enterprise might be important. And this is just an interesting observation for the techies that um, five megabits per second um, uh, file download is uh, 115 meg megabits per second download average which is probably to do all sorts of complicated network things like TCP slow start and, and whatever else. But um, it is a good point that the, the net effect of having a bigger pipe, but taking time maybe to reach a, a peak speed um, on smaller files means the absolute benefit depends on the type of application that you have. So it's been a little bit... Um, little bit of a change uh in the way the the gps has done or the gnss by gnss what we mean is is all of the constellations gps glonass Beidou, galileo so russian european uk constellation um so i guess what is the point the point is here if you're going to put it in a vehicle you need to think carefully about the antenna we have some options it's a conversation we would take offline, but it is specialist because you've got to filter out the GNSS from the 5G signal on the same, on those two center pins that you can see on the module. So 
key thing uh, with the 50-20 from Robusto is it's everything's in the box. Um, when you get to the lower end of the market and also for environmental reasons, um, we're trying to avoid uh, putting too much in the in, in the box for cost and waste purposes. But uh, when we're up at, um, you know, several hundred pounds um, and the, the, the likelihood is the volumes are relatively low and lots and lots of proof of concepts at the moment uh, seems to be the way to go. That is by far the simplest and easiest solution. Um, that's just a slide on this, the default antenna that comes in the box. Top left there, you can see um, the style of antenna that's going to be required. Um, this That whole project around that has moved on. So as I say, if you want to consider specialist antennas, or uh, especially with GPS, um, getting a sub six gig antenna in itself is not so much of an issue. Um, and then you've got a variety of mounting options. It's primarily DIN rail wall mount kit. Um, there is also an L-shaped bracket, which is surprisingly uh, surprisingly popular. It's disappeared. But there, there's an L-shaped bracket. So if you, your DIN rail, your wall mount, you want to change the orientation, that can, can be quite handy. Um, and there's a few questions that have come up. Again, some of them are from our more industrial base, but um, it might be might be interesting. Does the 5020 support Bluetooth like the R2110 does? Um, so no is the answer. Um, but if a, a, a Bluetooth to 4G gateway um, is of interest, that's one of the things, one of the many things um, in the Robustel stable. Uh, question two is about the antennas. Uh, let's take that offline. Um, when we when we know what's going to be required for your specific installation, we can come up with the right mechanical and, and RF solution. Um, how many GNSS antennas are required? Um, only only one is required, but you we you need to see the orientation of which frequencies are serviced on which which of the antennas. So. As I say, it's a bit of an odd one on the GPS on this box. It's the way this, the module vendor has implemented it. Um, and yeah, with the right antenna choices, uh, it should be a non-issue. Now, the last bit I thought was an interesting little exercise to, to generate some empathy for where where does all this come from? So the, the, the one component in the bill of materials for this product is the cellular module. And here are the some online prices uh, as of a, a couple of months back. Um, if you wanted to just go and buy one of those components, um, so you're looking at six, um, six or seven hundred dollars uh, for the um, the actual cellular module itself. So moving on to a bit of the um, more consumer side of things, um, or more of the strategy side of things, it's who is actually looking, um, who is actually looking for these products. So the big, without shadow of a doubt, the big early adopters at the moment are the MNOs and MVNOs, and part of that is because they're looking for endorsement and uh, you know sort of applications and use cases for their networks that they've just spent um, uh, millions, you know, or billions of dollars building. So absolutely engaging with those people are a potential target. The thing I was alluding to at the start of this conversation is that it would seem there's a lot of um, a lot of interest generated, and whilst logically a, a lot of people in this space don't necessarily need um, the bandwidth or that kind of thing, what we're seeing is people looking for what next? What do we do next it, when hardware is getting commoditized? So there are a surprising number of people that are looking for um, just for the what next as a way to stave off the um, commoditization that is happening in the market. 
And without a shadow of a doubt, if you're going to go out, um, so this is the future proof, is if you're going to go out and um, uh, swap out a load of 3G devices, well, you now have to think carefully, are you going to swap out and go from 3G to 4G? Um, or are you going to go from 3G to 5G? So that is a, a, a key reason to think about um, 5G. The question is, where can we actually get 5G wins now? Which is probably the more, uh, the, the more salient bit. Um, with this particular unit, for, uh, the in vehicle is a clear um, a clear target because traditionally these guys have used um, you know bonded routers potentially very expensive bonded routers and very quickly and easily and inexpensively you can get a much fatter pipe um, for you know a, a relatively compared with the the, the higher routers a more com competitive price. And the important thing to note is the major bus operators that would probably infest in this kind of thing um, are running fleets in major cities, and major cities are the first recipients of 5G. And so the other um, key uh, area that there are wins to be had is in enterprise, we know for a variety of reasons, uh, either as primary or as failover, there are people interested in using 5G. The biggest thing at the moment, which uh, no one can argue with, is the level of uh, coverage, the level of rollout. Obviously, um, if if your deployments are where people are and in cities, then you're going to be in with a good shout this year to, to cover the major cities. But the real... Um, the point that might tip the balance uh, for you guys, if you're looking to sell a high value router rather than a low value router, is that in this product, the 4G is CAT16. And CAT16, you can arguably just describe as giving you the best possible 4G whilst you wait for 5G to come in. So most entry level products have CAT4 LTE. And as you move up the categories, you get more and more of what they call carrier aggregation. So you can have more multiples. Uh, you can draw on bandwidth from, from multiple places. So you can have the best possible 4, 4G while you wait. And then you have um, 5G coverage once it becomes available. So what's next? Um, the current uh, evolution is aimed at uh, the applications we've shown in there with um, a bandwidth increase being the, the key factor, high bandwidth flow latency as we catch that uh, initial edge of, of the practical 5G world. Um, but as the technology moves forward, so into release 16, uh, we'll start to see, uh, and we'll start to see operators in the coming years start to roll out millimeter wave 5G. And because it's quite a powerful uh, router in itself, we're seeing lots and lots of requests to um, add additional software like the concept of Bluetooth and other interfaces at the edge, and then use the 5G as the backhaul. And I think this is where I take over. Thank you so much, David, for uh, for that. Uh, I know we uh, had some technical difficulties midway. I'd like to reassure people David was not, as you probably saw from him holding up the product, wasn't connected to his 5G router at the time. And had he been, hopefully, we might have had a bit more of a stable connection going through. But thank you very much, David, for, for that. And um, I know no a couple of people have, uh, want maybe a less technical breakdown of the product, which I'm happy to provide um, post-webinar. Um, but for now, we look at how and when we can get the R5020. So primarily the product is already live on our website. However, it is currently set to pre-order. Uh, David, do we have any more updates on what the ETA is likely to be for the, uh, the, the physical launch in the UK? Yeah, so at the moment, because this is quite near the leading or bleeding edge, um, 
the 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 product's finished but we've only just been able to start the ce process due to um basically upstream component changes that um that had to be accommodated before we embarked on uh on that ce process so you're looking at probably uh, april now unfortunately was certainly hoping it was going to be next month but realistically we need to say um uh, april is the eta for the for the production units that are fully ce marked perfect so as soon as the product is fully ce marked registered signed off ready to go it will be available uh from foregone solutions either on our website or you can contact uh myself or a member of my sales team um you can reach uh, me on jamie at foregone.co.uk alternatively obviously the email info at foregone.co.uk for general inquiries now uh, i just want to hand across now uh we've got some questions uh that have been sent through in the chat whilst uh, uh whilst david was talking earlier um and obviously if you've got any questions uh, for david or for myself uh, please uh, send them through into the uh, into the chat box, and we'll be uh, we'll be happy to take those. So, the first question we had uh, was from Daniel. He asked about the ignition control you mentioned. He said, "Is yep. the, is the unit uh, either uh, either on or off, or is there an element of like control, low power options, etc.?" So, the primary function is to protect the battery. So, when we sense the ignition line goes low. Uh, in software, you can set X minutes before shutdown, but there is no, uh, there is nothing beyond that functionality. It's purely just to get the router off, um, so it doesn't drain the battery. Perfect. Okay. Um, the next question was from Darren Cousins. He asked about, uh, well, it wasn't really a question. It was more of a statement suggesting about the directional antenna and 5G mast information might be very much needed to get the best from the equipment. Is that true? Or is it a case of the equipment can op operate standalone without too much issues? Um, it, it all, I, I guess that comes down to geometry, really, doesn't it? When, when you have, you know, directional antennas and things like that. I think the... At this stage, I would say I don't know the best answer to that question in the context of needing multiple uh, multiple attachment points. So is if what you're attaching to all comes from the same mast, then I doubt it would be an issue. But uh, if there's a prospect of the, the, the carrier aggregation effect coming from different locations, then maybe this uh, ironically it's a great question because maybe it forces you into needing to go omnidirectional in this setup more um to to be assured of a service but it's a very good question about 5g nsa uh, implementation and um i think what we'll do is we'll go back to hq and we'll come back with with a little bit more insight on that thank you perfect Perfect. A um, uh, question from Noel Bradford, um, and I, I did answer this in the chat. I suspected I, I knew the answer, but I'll just confirm it with yourself, David. We, he asked, what kind of uh, IP rating does the R5020 have and can it be mounted externally? And I suggested that like other uh, 4G products, it's likely to need an IP rated enclosure. Uh, but can you clarify that? Yeah, so th this uh, entirely indoor product there's not can't be put outdoor at all, but um, I think the I think the rating of something with like open Ethernet ports is around IP30 or something of that ilk, and as you say, the, the Robusto have an enclosure that rehouses all of the Robusto range. The backplate can be changed to accommodate it, and then you put it outside um, and just present uh, generally just present the PoE um, Cat5 PoE connection. Perfect. Uh, a question from uh, Darren Johnson asking about the max cable length for the external for an external antenna. Uh, and to clarify, you said he lived on worked on a boat and would be really handy to stick up on a mast. Yeah, tricky one. Um, I don't think I'm not sure you can define a, a, a maximum. Well, you you can't define a maximum per se, but you know a, a rule of thumb that. I've always worked to is of the order of maybe 10 meters, but it's the, the, the losses in the coax 
could exceed the gain that you get for putting it up the mast. And I hate to say it because RF is a bit of a uh, bit of black magic, as we probably all know. Um, it's very difficult to be prescriptive. I mean, you can go online and put in a DB calculator for for gains and losses uh, and put in the coax type that you're using to ascertain the, you know, at, at a certain length, what is the loss. Um, but of course, you, you know, in these systems, you've got variable power outputs and things like that. So it's, it's I wish I could give a definitive answer because I think I'd be rich. Um, but uh, yeah, keep the coax as, as short as, as humanly possible or what we're seeing people doing in houses. And I appreciate it's, it's far easier in a house than it is up a, a, a boat's mast um, is use the POE, the Cat5 POE to extend the, um, the position of the router and then have a short run of coax from the router. But that would require the outdoor enclosure, etc. Yeah, Darren's just come back and said that 10 metres is more than, enough, more than enough for his setup anyway. So that's perfect. That's answered that question. Uh, wonderful. Um, John Bayliss asked, uh, not about the R5020, but about his current uh, product, which is a Robusto R1520, the 1520, asking if that has CAT16. No, that's um, all the 1500 series are all CAT4. And is it the R2110 that's the CAT16 model, or is that? So the, the 1500 series is CAT4. The 2110 has a CAT6 option. So there's a Cat Four and Cat Six, okay, which goes to show how how much cost there was in the you know going back to when the product first evolved. There's so much difference in costs; it was worth running two separate product lines um, to give people that that differentiation. And then we move up to the R fifty twenty, where the LTE is Cat sixteen, not six, but sixteen, and that's pretty much. If the operator offers carrier aggregation at a certain location and you can get it, the box will take advantage. Perfect. Um, Kieran's asked about what the pricing is likely to be for the R5020. Now, I can answer that. The pricing is already live on our website. We've set a preliminary pr price for pre-orders of the product, uh, which is £599. Now, our pricing, as, as as most of you have already foregone customers, you'll know that our pricing, you know, it, it fluctuates based on, um, you know, the, the cost of purchasing a product. So over time, as the technology becomes cheaper, uh, the product will likely change or, or update in price. So the best way to get the most up-to-date price is always to check on foregone.co.uk. Um, the any, I think, Jamie, I just, think... just on that, just on that point, Jamie, if... Um... Oh, yeah. If there are any um, significant projects, um, and by significant, obviously we mean volume, uh, because it's a high value product, let's give you a, a rule of thumb, maybe 50 pieces, it would be worth you inquiring to Jamie if there's any, if there is any additional supported price available from the manufacturer, because um, either it may be, uh, yes, Robusto can help, and it may be, um, it's a, more likely at this stage of the game. It's a strategic um, project. It's a nice case study, and obviously we want to, um, to to get good marketing exposure. So I would say if there's volume of fifty plus in a deal that you're aware of, then um, maybe it, it may be worth inquiring to see if there is a, a supported price as well. I would say it's definitely worth inquiring. We'll, we'll always do our best to, to support everyone if they've got a project work that they need to work on. And I'm sure David would be happy to to offer his support as well to those kind of projects. Um, qu question from Chris West here. Uh, does the product support Modbus TCP to Modbus RS485 protocol conversion? Yes. Brilliant. That's a nice, simple answer. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Well, I hope that answered your question, Chris. Well, it's, uh, Ian it's Jones, a great question. It's, it's, it's a lovely question because there's no grey. Yes. Uh, no grey areas. <laughs> Perfect. I love that. Uh, Ian Jones has asked a question. Is there any online training on how to set it up or any online guides? Um, there's there's not videos, but there are. Um, the, there's the manual. There's quick start guides. I mean, something, uh, you know, we've been within reason that we can we can accommodate is um if you want to send if you want to have a stab at setting one of these things up yourself and then send 
via Forgon the export the config file, um, I'm more than happy to spend five or 10 minutes just running through the config, just annotate it for you. Say, you know, have you thought of switching this on or switching that off? A free config review is part of what we do, and it's part of the reason why um, people are very happy with Robusto at the moment because it's that little bit of that second pair of eyes uh, and a conversation with a human rather than just a ticketing system. And to add to that, um, and uh, I've noticed that Mark Boyce has just put a question in that's, uh, that I'm going to answer as well, is in terms of training, support, uh, config, uh, it's uh, obviously foregone have an R5020 that we're currently testing and utilising. Um, so any support uh, can be available via the foregone premium support service as well, which I know a number of you are already familiar with. Uh, and you've worked with our, uh, our support team before. Uh, on 4G and cellular de other cellular de deployments. So we'll be more than happy to help you. And we can provide guides as well, should you need them. Uh, so hopefully that answers your question, Ian and, and Mark as well. Um, Mark's also asked if there's an online R remote management service, so RMS uh, for the devices. Yeah, so I think we got we got slightly out of order with our slides here um, somehow, but no this matter. This right at the we... start, wasn't it? The uh, RMS slide, I believe. Yeah. Let's just, no issue, we can just whiz back to it. Um, so, yeah, arguably we could spend an entire session on the RCMS platform. And this is a, this is another reason why, um, it, you know, relatively robust are doing very well at the moment. It's a Microsoft Azure based um, router management platform. You can see, uh, like you see, you get the the map view and everything that is read only like signal strength and current data usage online offline all of that is completely free and then if you want to change config over the air or you want to use the the vpn service that's integrated into it um, then that is in essence pay as you go and we find people much ha happier with that adoption model which is get everything online do your basic diagnostics and only if you've got a fire burning and or you want to save a site visit because you think you might be able to fix something over the air, um, then you apply a license. So bottom line is um, Robustail make less money and you guys save money, and um, which is a, a, not an issue because it, it it's now being treated as a, a tool for, you know, for the, the greater adoption of hardware. It's not a revenue stream. So... There's 15 people over at HQ working on this. They're now Microsoft Azure certified. So this is spawning slightly into, you know, I, we love the platform. Can you add this Modbus data? Um, ironically, what, you know, what we just discussed, can you add just this, the level for this pump on another screen? So you can see the direction of travel there. Um, but certainly all of the basic features that you would expect, uh, including API interface, um uh, config over the air firmware over the air all of those things um they are all in rcms and you know if there was enough interest we could do a 30 minute webinar on on how to use and adopt the platform uh, a couple of people are having troubles accessing that free trial link there david so perhaps if when we send out the um uh, when we send out the slides afterwards post we can perhaps send along uh, a copy of, of of this slide with a link on it. It's just having a couple of issues getting onto that. Apparently, I'm not quite sure how or why. Um, but we'll come we'll come back to that. So for those of you having, I know a couple of you said you're having issues accessing that link. So as soon as uh, we have that sorted for you, we'll we'll email that out uh, across to you along with the slides. For, if you don't want to wait, guys, um, you can go to robustel.com um, and then just browse top right of the page. Um, the sign up um link is on on the front on the home page of robustel.com so i think yeah i think i think uh kieran has just possibly i don't know if he's put the uh link i think he's just put the link in himself kieran so thank you for that um right so we'll go back to some more uh, we've got lots of questions david so <laughs> um 
just bear with me two minutes. I'm just going to go back to the uh, next question was from Mike Stevens saying, does the product's UI web interface allow rebranding or layered uh, control access for offering varying levels of onward service management for our customers? And someone else has put plus one on the white labeling. So a couple of people interested in that. Yes. It does. Perfect. So no gray areas there. I love that. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, uh, it, it, the only, uh, again, as always, the only grey area might be a, a, a commercial one, depending on how it's deployed or whether you just, if a if customer just does everything themselves, um, then it's a non-issue. If it needs to come from the factory in that fashion, then obviously as a conversation. But if there's if there's a market opportunity, we'll do everything we can to make it a win-win um, for those that are, are bringing the opportunity. Yeah, I think to clarify as well on that, we've been we've been working with David for a lot, uh, quite some time now on several large scale projects involving Robustel, and I think the the reason we enjoy working with Robustel so much is that they are very flexible and they are willing to try and tailor as much as they can to the customers and end user requirements. So if you've if you, if you've got a project and you're not sure about the suitability of Robustel, always get in touch with us. Uh, myself and David will be more than happy to uh, to support with any kind of project to see if we can get some sort of implementation service sorted for you. A uh, question from Kieran McCloy. Does the R5020 support 24 volt PoE? No. No, doesn't support that. OK. Um, Mark Boyce has asked, does it have support for sending SMS commands to interrogate device reset and configure? Yes, it does. Um, and it's got some advanced, a few advanced commands over and above um, what's typically available. So everything you can do in the GUI can go into the payload of an SMS. So you can send uh, an SMS that says ping 8.8.8.8. .8 and then you'll get the ping response back if everything is connected correctly. So absolutely everything you can do can be either one or several commands inside an SMS. And you're basically having that text conversation, command line interface conversation. It's just the bearer happens to be SMS rather than a, a terminal sat there in front of you. So very much so. And, and the uh, the the ability to connect and disconnect the mobile interface and also a function called Smart Reboot um, for anyone using roaming sims is specifically developed um, to, if, if there is anyone using roaming sims, they may have seen the issues that you can get. And Smart Reboot um, is explicitly designed to solve that problem. So SMS for us is a massive out of band um, safety net that could save a site visit. So I think it's a great question. and. Um, it supports the standard stuff plus more. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, uh, another question from Mike Stevens asking, what's the length of time for the subscription to the RCMS? Uh, is it yearly chunks or do you offer daily, weekly, monthly or pay-as-you-go options? So there's absolutely no... Um, the only stipulation is a minimum order quantity of licenses of 12 pieces. So that's either 12 times $1 for the standard license or 12 times $3 for the advanced license, which includes the, the VPN and everything else. So your absolute minimum is you're going to have to spend, say, 10 or 30 quid, respectively, to put some licenses in the pot. Now, after you've hit the MOQ of 12, you can buy 13 or 13,000. It's, it's up to you. Depends how you want to manage the transactions. But you can draw down from that pot of licenses one at a time when you need them and switch off auto renew so you don't burn them a subsequent month. So it really is in that to that end, it's a pay as you go thing. You have a problem site, apply a license, solve the problem. Obviously, Robusto would prefer that you see so much value in it that you leave all of your devices live on a one dollar um, license from month to month and at low volume it's probably a no-brainer to do that at high volume. It's, um, uh, yeah, it, it doesn't scare. And, and also to note that at high volume, there is um, absolutely the discount on licenses because um, that $1 or $3 doesn't scale compared with other technical solutions to that problem. So, again, if there's any volume, talk to the guys at Foregone and we will um, find a way to make it fit the business case. 
Perfect. Thank you, David. A uh, question from Darren again, Darren Cousins. Uh, where does Starlink sit in the market compared to this product? You know what? Rather than uh, waffling on, I don't know. <laughs> OK, perhaps we can we can have a little investigate for you, Darren, and we can perhaps come back uh, uh, to you on that question. Um, the uh, <laughs> thanks, Darren. Uh, the the, the uh, another question from Kieran McCloy asking: Is there an SMS command list easily found? Uh, can't, I'm struggling to find it on the Robusto site. Not easily found. No. Uh, if you can ping ping Jamie your email address, make the request. I'll get it over to you. I'll tell you where the challenge uh, lies. Just briefly, where the challenge lies there is it's potentially enormous. And it's potentially difficult to, well, it's, it's quite onerous to maintain and make sure it's 100% accurate and up to date because the interdependence is in the operating system. So that's why you'll see people like Robustel are rightly or wrongly, I'm not saying it's right, but um, uh, rightly or wrongly, people are um, cautious to publish that because if you publish, it's got to be right. So, but I will, I'll get you a document and share with you any caveats over it. It should give you a very good feeling for um, what is actually there. Perfect. Um, so, uh, Kieran sent me his email address. So, I'll be, uh, I'll, I'll, Kieran, what I'll do is I'll drop you an, uh, an email once I've got that information from David. I'm going to write that down as well. So, it's the SMS commands list. Perfect. And uh, I think we've got. Um, uh, a question from James Kimberley. This is the last question we've got. So if you've got any more questions whilst you're here, do feel free to send them through. Um, but the last question that I've got here uh, from James Kimberley is, do you offer a dual SIM, dual router model using four antennas? Uh, yes. The only... <laughs> I'm tiring myself for these caveats. The the only limitation is it's it's dual SIM, dual radio. In fact, it's terribly unprofessional, but we all we're all friends here now. Um, this unit here that you can see um, is dual SIM, dual radio, but there isn't um, a, a bonding or link aggregation type capability. It was developed for fast failover only. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Right. I think that is uh, all the questions we've got. I can see someone's typing, so I don't know if that if that's already stopped now. But um, I think perhaps we we call it a day there. Um, what I'll do is I'll pop my email address in the chat box. If anyone has any additional questions for David, uh, what we'll do is um, uh, is is, uh, is if you ping them across to me on email and I can either set you up on a call or potentially we can get that question answered very quickly. Um, I appreciate everyone's left some really nice feedback. So thank you very, very much. And to answer your question, James, yes, uh, you'll get a copy of the slides and a copy of the recording. Thank you everyone so much for joining us. We, uh, we really appreciate it and I hope you found the time useful and valuable. Thank you guys, very much appreciated. Uh, if you need anything, give us a shout. Have a great day. Have a good day, everyone. Bye-bye now.